Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, it's good to see many of you back. Uh, can Can you hear me? Somebody quickly confirm. Yes, sir. Good. Uh, thank you. So, um, let's see. Um, I what I'm going to do today and uh, and tomorrow is talk about um, clusters, groups of galaxies. Now, um, if you remember the first uh, four lectures at the beginning of this, uh, this course, uh, we introduced uh, the scale of the universe, how to measure distances, and introduced the concept of galaxies. And at that time, I had, because we had talked about the um, distance scale, I had also talked about how distances to objects are measured and how then we realized that the universe is full of galaxies rather than being a whole con, um, uh, a collection of stars. One galaxy as opposed to many galaxies. And galaxies then are the building blocks of the universe. Since then, you've had quite a lot of um, uh, lectures on various aspects of galaxies. Uh, in particular, you've had lectures on galaxies um, by Dr. Kano Chaha. And then, of course, uh, uh, this morning, uh, you looked at another aspect of galaxies, and that is um, the supermassive black holes in the middle of the galaxy, as well as the, the effects it has on the galaxies themselves. So what I'm going to talk about, in, uh, and there might be some repetition with what I talked about last time, where I also talked about interacting galaxies, is um, how galaxies then make up some of the structures in the universe. Right. So let me share my screen. And um, see, the galaxies are not the largest things in the universe. They make up some of the structures that we find in the universe. So we are going to talk about groups and clusters of galaxies, <clears throat> right? So, um, and this just is a mosaic of uh, various kinds of galaxies that you find in some various environments. Um, as I said, there might be some um, repetition from what I said last time and from what other people have said, but let me go ahead and anyway, repetition does not hurt. Um, I said last time also that how um, we look at the basic building blocks of the universe, the galaxies of various kinds, the elliptical galaxies, which are essentially soidal round galaxies, non -ro not rotating much. They're full of very old stars and they are normally found in denser environments, as I will say towards the end of tomorrow's lecture uh, and show. And then there are <coughs> the um, flat spiral galaxies, which um, are the most common. And then I also talked about how galaxies interact with each other, talked about how the Milky Way will interact with its nearest neighbor Andromeda and, and how it's already interacting with the local galaxies. We looked at how essentially the scale of galaxies then is about a megaparsec. And so when we look at collections of galaxies, we look at that kind of scale, a few megaparsecs. I talked about, this is again repeating what we said and what you've come across. We have, we live in a galaxy called the Milky Way and we are not at the center, but a little offset from the center, looking towards the middle of our galaxy. And you've heard about how there's a supermassive black hole in the middle of our galaxy. And we saw this picture of how our galaxy looks from inside hard to see this view from the Northern Hemisphere, even from India, but you really have to go a little south, south of the equator, and then you start seeing the Magellanic Clouds, the, the Milky Way in full glory. And the fact that we live, this is also what was covered, we live, uh, by we, I mean our galaxy, the galaxy we live in, Milky Way, uh, we live in a small group, which consists of two um, really big uh, galaxies. Um, and um, these galaxies have their own satellites, which are like little moons. And we saw last time how our galaxy is interacting with these, um, uh, with these little satellite galaxies. Um, and, and so the two major galaxies are the Milky Way and uh, the Andromeda galaxy, which is uh, 0.7 megaparsecs away falling towards us. We looked at that orbit last time. And each of them has all these satellites around them, and many of them are falling into their big galaxy. 
this is a general picture that you see in, in, in the universe. Um, big galaxies have little galaxies go around them, very small, tiny galaxies, which are 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 times smaller than those galaxies. And they fall into the big galaxies. These are called minor mergers. And then um, the big galaxies themselves with these systems merge together and they're called major mergers. Uh, we saw this uh, in, in a good example in our own galaxy where the nearest satellite is falling into our galaxy. This will become <clears throat> an interesting point in what I have to say today. And this is why I um, brought this up again. And this is um, the Andromeda galaxy, which is our nearest system. I also showed you <clears throat> a picture of um, the, uh, this kind of um, um, a simulation of the universe in matter. Just a minute, I just pause, half a minute. Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, so here is a, um, a simulation. This is a simulation not of galaxies, but of the underlying matter. And I'm going to talk about that today. Uh, this underlying matter has um, uh, shows the large scale distribution of matter in the universe. Now, where do galaxies, groups of galaxies, clusters of galaxies fit in? And if you have this. If you think of this box as maybe a couple of hundred megaparsecs across, remember the scale here is that the distance between galaxies is about a megaparsec. Then you can figure out what the scale is from, from this map. Um, our um, clusters would be, um, would be these things. If you look at the, the web-like structure of matter in the universe, where these filaments cross, <coughs> sorry, clusters would be several megaparsecs across, maybe three, four, five megaparsecs. If you go all to all the members that are gravitationally bound together um, around, uh, this circle is a, maybe a little large compared to a cluster. This is just meant to not show the extent of the cluster, but to enclose what is called a cluster. A cluster would be probably a dark matter halo of this size, the blob that you see there. But dotted on these filaments, you can see little systems. Maybe the tiniest dots here are galaxies and, um, and galaxy-sized halos. And then small systems of them, two or three together, would be, would be groups. And so our local group might be something like this or something like this, if you see my arrow. Right, And so in this particular circle, you can probably see two, three, four, five groups in there. They're all, all, all tiny ones. And, and these are the most common systems of galaxies in which galaxies live. Galaxies, um, as I said, often don't like to live alone. They are um, on these filaments, they're born on these filaments, and then they make little groups. And these groups then get together groups merge with each other to form larger structures. <clears throat> they also travel down these filaments. They are, are traveling down our, our uh, particular local group is probably on, on something like this, and it's traveling down on these filaments, going towards being gravitationally attracted to, um, towards a much bigger system. So it's like you being in a small village and you travel to the big city, so you are, um, but it, normally you are not gravitationally attracted. These things are gravitationally attracted. And so, um, and, and then you fall into this big, at, at, the, at the crossroads of these um, matter filaments, <coughs> um, these clusters of galaxies. And for our local group, the nearest cluster of galaxies is the Virgo cluster. And the Virgo cluster is about 15 megaparsecs away from us. So you can see that on this scale. Uh, and then, 
the Virgo cluster itself is moving towards another bigger system, which is the Hydra Centaurus system, which is 50 by zero megaparsecs away from us. And that itself is moving towards a much larger system, which is of the order of 100 megaparsecs away, things like that. So part of the puzzle now, and we don't understand this very well, is to, is to figure out this hierarchy of, um, of structures and, uh, and our local neighborhood. Uh, we're trying to do this three-dimensional view of where we are in the universe. We can call that cosmography as opposed to geography. And we are very much now, and that's very exciting in astronomy, very similar to what the, what the explorers were doing in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, trying to figure out where we are on the Earth, trying to find out where the continents are, how to, what, what there is at the other side of this planet, what the shape of the planet is and stuff like that. And that's exactly what we are trying to do in the whole universe right now, trying to figure out uh, where we are, what our nearest structures are, where we are going, where are things like that. And there, these groups of galaxies um, the, um, play a very important role. <clears throat> so um, as I said, galaxy groups uh, can be small um, groups. For example, here's the Whirlpool Galaxy M51 together with M52, which is a smaller galaxy. They're interacting very closely. You remember the mice, which is this, very similar to that. And you can see this is a uh, a very nice deep optical image. You can see all the, the stars around being as a result of this interaction. Checked out, there are all these streams um, happening everywhere. So this is not in the local group nearest. So this is um, a nearby a group about a few megaparsecs away. And uh, apart from these two, there are other small galaxies in this group that, that I haven't highlighted here, but there will be dwarf galaxies. So this can be a small group. Here's a famous group on the right called the Stefan's Quintet. And this is uh, a work I did quite a lot, along with actually um, Dr. Saikia, who um, gave you the lecture in the morning, um, did quite a lot of work on Stefan's Quintet. Uh, and uh, and uh, we've done some work on the Stefan's Quintet. This is a picture we produced from the Hubble Space Telescope, in which you can see there are looks like five galaxies in there. This is a combination of an optical image with the blue being the X-ray image superposed on it. So if you take out the blue part, you can see the deep optical image. Actually, four of those five galaxies are actually together. Another one is in the foreground. This one, actually, this nice galaxy is in the foreground. It doesn't belong to the group. Even though it's called a quintet, we now know that um, one of them is not part of the system, it's in the foreground, but these four galaxies are interacting very closely with each other. Right? So that's the example of the group. So what do these things do? Why are we talking about these things? Why are they important in, in cosmology, in, uh, in astrophysics? You have to contrast these with clusters like this. Right? These are the mega clusters of galaxies. These are the mega cities of galaxies, right? Where um, here's a, a galaxy that has thousands, I mean, a galaxy cluster that has thousands of galaxies. You can see they're all together. And I mean, there are various interesting features in there which have to do with gravitational lensing, which I'll talk about later on. But you can see how in a cluster of galaxies, and this is made to look like a true color picture, even though no image in astronomy is taken with colored cameras. We take essentially grayscale pictures with different filters and then put them together to make them look like color images. So if you have a blue filter and a red filter and green filter, et cetera, and you try to balance them together to make them look like um, the true color, here is something that's as true color as possible and you can see the galaxies in clusters are very red. And red means that these are old stellar populations. Red also means that there is very little new star formation going on in, in these clusters. And, uh, and so these, these are the richest systems. They're very rare. Not many of these are there in the nearby universe, but these have been very well studied. And so these are the densest places. These are where the filaments of the cosmic web meet. So if you look at how these things scale up, and I'll talk about X-ray pictures in a minute, but these are X-ray images of, uh, X-ray images kind of probe the underlying matter 
in the system of what a galaxy looks like, what a group looks like, and what a cluster looks like. And we'll come back to these uh, X-ray portrayals of, of these systems. But just to show that um, the, the essential masses of these things scale up and they look similar if you look at the right components. What do you mean by components? What are these clusters made of? Is a cluster of galaxies or a group of galaxies just some galaxies together? Or are there other things uh, associated with them? What are they made of? So let's ask that question. And to do that, we'll look at the various components of clusters and groups of galaxies. So uh, groups of galaxies, clusters that's made up of galaxies, I told you already. They're also made up of stars between the galaxies. I told you that, I showed you all these streams that are coming out of galaxies as they interact with each other. Two galaxies come close to each other, they pull out stars from each other. They interact with each other, they pull out stars from each other. So there are significant numbers and we are only now with the current technology in the last 10, 20 years finding these things because it's very hard to find single stars or streams of stars that connect galaxies. Very difficult to find them. And then um, we, um, these um, clusters, in addition to galaxies, have in between the galaxies, you have hot gas and you have cold gas. By gas, I mean in plasma. <clears throat> and by cold gas, I mean gas that is um, you know, a few hundred degrees hot. By hot gas, I mean things that are 10 to the power 6, 10 to the power 7 degrees hot. Right? And these are actually, as you will see, the predominant baryonic component of clusters of galaxies. Right? What do you mean by baryons? Baryons are things that are made up of quarks. So these are protons and neutrons, things that are in our periodic table. So if you thought galaxies are the predominant component of clusters, no. Even in the baryonic component, things that are made up of ordinary matter, the stuff that I and you are made of, things that are made up of, um, of uh, things that are in the periodic table, then <clears throat> Actually, it's the intergalactic gas that dominates. And most of the, this is a surprising discovery in the last 20 years or so, is that most of the baryonic matter in the universe is in the form of hot gas, not in the form of you know, 300 degree Kelvin human beings or um, things that we have around us, right? And then there is a lot of cold gas, which emits um, in the radio waves because they are cold, they're a few hundred degrees um, hot, and they emit um, um, in, in radio astronomy, and you saw some examples of them in this morning's lecture, in, in Professor Saikia's lecture. So, um, so that's the, the kind of uh, um, uh, the stuff that you have. And so in between the galaxies, there's a lot of stuff as well. And most importantly, clusters are made up of dark matter. So this is something that I'm going to talk about first now. I'm sure other people have talked about dark matter, but just to be complete, I will take you through the evidence of dark matter on galaxy scales and cluster scales. Um, and it might be repetitive, might repeat what other people have done, but I need to have um, this in here. When I showed you this picture last time, sorry. when I showed you this picture, um, this uh, picture of uh, the distribution of matter, this is the distribution of dark matter as produced in a simulation. And this dominates, and this is not baryonic. Okay. So let's first look at the baryonic component, and then I'll go to the dark matter component. And today we're going to look at the, the constituents of, of, of um, clusters one, um, one at a time. So looking at the baryons, here is what we think is the baryon budget of uh, the universe. Now, why do we think that the non-baryonic component, which is dark matter is non-baryonic, is uh, more than the number of baryons? And that is because we know the number of baryons in the universe, the number of quarks, the total number of quarks in the universe from independent measurements. And one of the best measurements, and I'm not 
talking about this today, but I'm sure somebody has talked or will talk about the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background is very exquisitely studied through um, um, space-borne experiments like um, first COBE and then WMAP and now Planck. And from these, there are very nice constraints that can be put on the amount of the various components of the universe. It gives very nice uh, measurements of various things, like um, the rate of expansion of the universe, which is the Hubble parameter. It also gives you one of the parameters that you fit to the cosmic microwave background is the density of baryons in the universe. And that is, that is portrayed in this particular quantity called omega baryons. Omega being, as you know, the density of any component of the universe divided by the total density. Of so it's, it's the ratio. <clears throat> and you can see that from Planck, we know that the density of baryons in the universe, the density of quarks in the universe, is, and this is the kind of thing we are made of. We are made up of protons and neutrons, right? Uh, we're made up of quarks. So this is our kind of matter. The, the density of baryons in the universe is, um, this is the latest Planck value, and that's about 2.2% of the total matter energy density of the universe. Now, you can also see that there's an H value there, and that H is a parametrized number taken from the Hubble constant. And the Hubble constant is of the order of, say, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which in this unit, this little H is 0 0.7, 0 0.67, 0 0.71, 72, there's a big controversy going on. The Planck value is 0 0.67. And so if you multiply, if you put that in there, then this number turns out to be 0 0.0485, so about 5%. So 5% of the matter energy of the universe is in baryons, right? So we, we get that from the cosmic micro background. So you would think that in clusters of galaxies also, this is where the baryons will be. Baryons are not floating around everywhere in any different way than in clusters of galaxies. So we look at groups and clusters of galaxies. We can assume, we can actually verify this, but we can assume that that will be the baryon fraction of the matter of um, a cluster. 5% okay, of the matter will be in baryons. Now, so where are these baryons? So people have done this kind of census. People have looked at all the stars that you can find in all the galaxies. Now, people have done deep. Of course, we haven't seen the entire universe. But what people do is take random places in the universe, do a very deep three-dimensional survey of galaxies. They go down the luminosity function. They, of course, detect the, the most massive galaxies, then detect the, the less luminous, less luminous, and they fit a function to it so that and it converges, so you can figure out how many galaxies there are of what kind of light, and then you find the total amount of light in a certain filter, in a certain volume, a randomly taken volume in the universe. So from that, you can estimate the total amount, number of stars in that, um, in that volume in galaxies, because stars emit light. So if you're measuring light, you can measure what kind of mass is associated with that light? Because you know the mass of the sun and you know how much light the mass, the sun emits. So you know the ratio of mass to light. So people have done that. And so stars are baryonic, entirely baryonic. So you know now that 0.3% of the matter energy of the universe is in stars. This is a measured quantity. Similarly, one has looked at neutral gas, which is the cold gas I'm talking about. Neutral gas is atomic gas, which is in between the stars in the galaxy. And this is measured predominantly by the 21 centimeter wavelength radio line that it emits and the radio telescopes um, captured them. That is that amount, which is 0.06% of the mass of the universe. The molecular gas is even less this is in the form of molecular hydrogen, carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, things like that, you know, um, and, and stuff like that. This is the gas, the 
cold gas that's in between the galaxies. Remember, it's very, very important because it's from this molecular gas that stars are formed. Stars are not formed from hot gas. Stars are formed from, from clouds of cold gas. And, and this gas is in atomic and molecular form and dotted along the spiral arms in spiral galaxies, mostly. And so this is, but so you add all of this up and the hot intergalactic gas, as I said, is, um, is, is more than the amount of stars. Add all of that up. It doesn't add up to this 0.048, right? So there's still a lot of baryons that are missing. If you assume that clusters have the same ratio of baryonic matter to non-baryonic matter as the rest of the universe, which is what you get from the cosmic micro background, a lot of baryons are missing and we don't know where these are. And this is one of the biggest puzzles right now in observational astronomy. And if any of you want to start working on uh, a new problem that's going to dominate um, uh, astronomy in various forms, in interesting forms in the next few decades, this is one of them. And one of them is to look at the baryon budget of the universe. See, I mean, there are some hints that there are things that we are missing. So here's a very, 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 very interesting picture, according to me. So this is a, a very deep image of the Virgo cluster. I don't know if I have a picture of the actual cluster. No, I've forgotten to put up. But the Virgo cluster is the nearest cluster, as I said, 15 megaparsecs away. And this is the deepest picture ever taken of any optical, any optical picture ever taken, because this was taken by um, a telescope, a 40 inch, a, a one meter telescope dedicated to looking at the same object for more than about 12 years or so. Just nothing else. Every night, same object. And it was optimized that the university that Nihos belongs to, KH Western Reserve University, bought this telescope, a very famous Schmidt telescope in Arizona, and made it into the Virgo cluster telescope for almost 20 years. Now it's doing something else. But so this is the deepest image ever taken. And this is 12 years worth of data every night. And you can see that if you, and I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture to show you of a normal picture of this um, cluster taken by a normal telescope. You'd have galaxies that look like this, but um, of this size. But because this is a very deep picture, you see these as very big because it's very deep. But the interesting part of this is, this is where you start seeing the intergalactic stars. I told you there are stars everywhere, but you can see just like I showed you the streams that come from the Sagittarius galaxy that's falling into the Milky Way. Here is a system of galaxies, one of the, the largest clusters um, of galaxies in our nearby universe, 15 megaparsecs away, long, long, far away. But by looking at these deep pictures, you can see that there are these streams of stars connecting all the different galaxies everywhere. There's, you know, there's hardly empty space between galaxies. So galaxies are exchanging stars. And when you see a, a nice image of um, a cluster like this, all the space in between are full of stars. You're not counting those stars. So they might actually feature in this budget, right? And we don't know how much there is, but it's very, very hard to find these stars. Um, I'll pause and, 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 and talk about questions in a minute. But I also wanted to talk about the other components. So here is something I might have showed you before, but we can also see, um, other than the stars, we can see the, um, the um, cold gas, the neutral gas. And I said, I told you before that um, these are, um, detected by radio telescopes. Somebody must have talked to you about radio um, detected um, atomic hydrogen already. And, and this is because atomic hydrogen has a, a natural transition in these conditions. Actually in quantum mechanics, we call these forbidden transitions. And this is, you know, the, uh, the hydrogen atom uh, has a, uh, a proton as a nucleus and an electron. 
and they can either have spin parallel or spin anti-parallel. And um, the transition from going parallel to anti-parallel is uh, a forbidden transition in the lab, but under conditions that, um, uh, that you have in, uh, uh, in the intergalactic medium in, uh, or even the interstellar medium in galaxies, the kinds of pressures and uh, temperatures that there are, it turns out that it is turns out to be the most important transition, and that leads to uh, uh, radiation, which has wavelength of 21 centimeters, um, 1420 giga, uh, megahertz, 1.4 gigahertz, and this is the most common transition that um, radio telescopes find. And you can see here a picture, two pictures of two galaxies, where the optical picture of the galaxy is shown in negative. So you can see the stars in the middle there, the black and white bit, the grayscale bit, right in the middle. And on top are contours of the neutral hydrogen that is being uh, detected by a radio telescope. So you can see that there's a lot more of the neutral hydrogen than the stars themselves the in extent, not in mass. If you actually measure the mass, you will find that the mass of the neutral hydrogen in these galaxies is of the order of 10 to the power nine um, solar masses, whereas the amount of um, stars that there are in these galaxies are in the units of 10 to the power 10 solar masses, so a factor of 10 more in stars, but the extent is much larger. So you can get a lot more neutral hydrogen stay, sticking out of the galaxy to four or five times the size of the galaxy that you see in the stars. And that is why they become important in the groups and clusters, because these fill the space in between the visible parts of galaxies, right? And these are the things that get involved when galaxies start interacting first, okay? Here's another example uh, of uh, the M81 system, M81 nearby galaxy, big galaxy like the Milky Way. Here's um, a small uh, satellite called M82. Uh, I showed you this picture, I think, before. When I talked about interacting galaxies, M82 is a very famous Starburst galaxy. And there's another galaxy here, these three. And when you take an optical picture of this, you, um, uh, you find them uh, as if they are not connected. Uh, but when you look at, on the left, is the 21 centimeter picture, of it, which, is the, which tells you the cold gas. Uh, the atomic gas, the neutral hydrogen in these galaxies. And you can see there's a lot of interaction and exchange of material going on. So not just stars are exchanged between galaxies, the gas is exchanged, but it's the gas that's exchanged first. And then along with it, stars are exchanged between galaxies. Okay. So pausing there, I, I, I'm looking at the chat box and I see a question from Shriya. It says, sir, what do you mean by missing baryons? I mean, that we know that part of something is missing by the knowledge of its whole existence. How do we know the whole number of variants? And let me just go back and, and show you what I actually already said. I said that we know the number of variants in the universe from the cosmic microwave background, which is a completely different measurement from just looking at the galaxies. This comes from cosmology, and somebody else is going to talk to you about it. We are told that, that there are so many um, galaxies, uh, baryons in the universe. Now, we are looking at galaxies and groups of galaxies and clusters of galaxies. And then we are looking at the, um, and counting how many there are, and they don't add up to the amount that is measured from the cosmological um, um, uh, measurements, right? So that's what I mean by the missing baryons. I'll deal with them, um, the hands uh, a little later. Let me finish this story first. So I talked about the, um, the cold gas. I talked about the stars in between the galaxies. And then I want to talk about the hot gas. Now, here is, um, these are X-ray pictures of uh, clusters of galaxies. These are two galaxies here. And you can see on the left uh, is a combination of the optical picture along with the X-ray picture. And on the right is only the X-ray picture. Of, of, of another cluster. Then you can see that these are megaparsecs across. So you see the continuous medium of 
hot gas. And when I say gas, it's actually in plasma because the gas is 10 to the power 7 degrees hot that emits in X-rays. And they emits thermal Brenner-Schalum. If you remember the radiation processes lectures right at the beginning of the first week, uh, there were all these various um, processes of radiation, black body radiation, and then inverse Compton, Compton radiation, uh, and then, um, then Brenner-Schalum. All of these were discussed. This is thermal Brenner-Schalum. The thermal gas, which is at 10 to the 7 degrees, um, it's emitting in the X-rays, right? And this, I told you, is the predominant baryon, frac baryon fraction in a cluster. All these, um, the, these are the galaxies. You can see just that's why we superposed a Hubble Space Telescope picture of the same um, uh, cluster on its X-ray image, which comes from the Chandra X-ray satellite. And the same resolution, almost the same resolution. And you can see that um, the, uh, but, but then the X-ray gas has been, uh, 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 blurred a little to show it better. You can see that it fills the entire cluster, um, uh, the core of it at least, where there are hundreds of galaxies, and this is in between the clusters. And so this is so actually, if you step out of a galaxy, you actually go into this this hot gas, except that the density of this gas is very very small. So the heat transfer, you're not going to get fried in this gas, but this gas it glows in X-rays. And, um, and, and so this is one way of actually finding um, the main components of the clusters. Now, I'll show you in, in a moment, the, um, the clusters are predominantly made of dark matter. And one of the ways of tracing the dark matter is looking at this hot gas because it's the gravitational potential of the dark matter halo of the cluster that's holding this together the, and making this very hot. So um, uh, let me just go to, um, just pause and look at the uh, people raising hands. Neil, go ahead, I've unmuted you. Ask your question. No, sir. Okay. So you showed the picture of the M82 galaxy uh, in the H alpha line and the uh, optical, yes. So not so H -alpha. There is a this is the 21 centimeter line, not H alpha. I showed long ago a picture of you of, of M82 in H alpha that shows star formation in there. But this is not H alpha, this is 21 centimeter. This is the cold gas from a radio telescope. So, so there is a central feature between the three galaxies that is missing on the right image. Absolutely right. So, you know, that's just a blob of gas that's been torn off from this galaxy. That's there. There are no stars associated with it. That's not a galaxy. That's just a, a blob of intergalactic gas. You see a lot of them. This is something, I don't know whether Professor Sekia is still here. I mean, this is his, his line. I mean, he's been work, he's worked a lot on detecting neutral hydrogen in, in galaxies and clusters. And that's something you see all the time. It's very interesting things. Right, so shall we go to um, Junik, who's next? Let me unmute you. Mute you. Yes, I can unmute you. Go ahead. Hello, sir. Uh, may I have uh, uh, sir, my question was, uh, when we talked about the galaxy clusters, there are uh, there are a lot of galaxies in there. Now, as we know, the, those galaxies itself, they are, for, they are just formed or they are just uh, inside some kind of dark matter halos. When you talk of galaxy, galaxy cluster, they are just inside a bigger dark matter halo. Now, as you said, all the galaxies are somehow connected to each other via the star chains. So, is it possible that the entire thing is inside a gigantic dark matter halo? Wait, wait. Let me talk talk about dark matter. I haven't got there yet. Just fish. Okay. We'll talk about all these hierarchical structure formation, everything we'll talk about. Don't worry. Okay. So, let me carry on with this story. So, I said that here we have the baryonic component of the... Um, <clears throat> Of the dark, of the um, um, uh, clusters, and then um, and that don't they don't add up, so this this itself poses a problem. But we're here talking about only five percent of the mass. The actual matter component, five uh, percent of the of the entire matter energy of um, of the universe, but the total um, um, and, and so that that constitutes about twenty percent of the amount of matter, because as you know. 
Uh, if you look at the matter energy of the universe, 30% or less than 30%, maybe 27% or so, is just matter. The rest is dark energy. Now, of the matter component of the universe, I'm saying that maybe 20% of that matter is baryonic. The rest is dark matter. Now, what is that dark matter? When, where do you find it? How do you find it? How do you know it is there? Now, other people might have talked about this, but let me, for the rest of today's lecture, talk about the evidence of dark matter in our galaxy and in clusters of galaxies and how you measure the mass of the dark matter. Okay. And Junik has raised uh, an interesting question about the hierarchical um, structure formation, which I will come to tomorrow. But today, the rest of today, I'm going to talk about dark matter. So I just, I just said that we are made up of all these elements that are in the periodic table, but the predominant component of the universe is not um, dark matter. So the first evidence we look at is, again, people have done it before with you, but let me do, do it again is looking at our galaxy itself, how our galaxy rotates. Okay, so we look at the rotation curve of our galaxy. To, in order to do that, let me just remind you that if you if something rotates as a solid body, just think of it as a, as a simple problem, like say a disc. I used to talk about LP records and CDs, but I realized that most people listening to this have never seen those things before. So just think of a, a, a platform um, which is rotating as a solid body. So if you have something like this, a rotating solid body, I might, might have played on this in parts, then <clears throat> the whole thing rotates. And so if you look at the rotation of any point on this, it would all have the same speed of angular rotation. Omega will be constant, right? Now, what is omega? Omega is V over R. <clears throat> if you have a linear velocity, linear speed at any point, and you take the R from on the center, then V over R is omega and that's constant. And so V is proportional to R. So on this particular rotating solid body platform, V is going to be proportional to R, okay? That's the signature of a solid body rotation. If you look at the, um, the, the solar system, you would find that in the solar system, forget Pluto now, but the other planets, you have the sun and you have the, 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 the planets, they move around the sun, but not the whole thing doesn't move as a solid body. If you plot the same thing, you plot the orbital speed as a function of distance from center, the velocities fall off. They don't go like that. That's the solid body rotation, right? Wheel-like rotation, I told you. So it's very different. And that is because most of the mass in the, um, in the solar system is in the center, and most of the mass is in the sun, and the um, planets themselves are like test particles. They have very little mass compared to the sun, and they're going around. Actually, they're going around the common center of mass, but the common center of mass is in the sun because the sun is most massive. So each of them will have a, a, almost a circular orbit, that's elliptical orbits. And those orbital speed is going to be going to fall off. Now, um, if you just think of them as circular orbits, you can work this out very, very easily. You can put the centri centripetal force, mv squared over r, equal to gmm over r squared which is the gravitational um, um, uh, attraction between the planet and the sun. And you can easily find that V, this V is proportional to R to the power half, right? So a one over R to the power, R to the power minus half. So you can see this equation is the equation. So this is V proportional to R, and this equation is one over R to the power half, right? And that's how it falls off. And this is what, happens when you're outside the system which has most of the matter. Now, when dark matter was not very well known, people expected the same thing to happen, the solar system to happen to our galaxy. Our galaxy is a central, uh, is a flat system which looks very much like the solar system. And then um, you uh, see that as you go out, um, 
as you go out, you um, uh, go to further and further distances. So is the galaxy, um, is, is most of the mass um, of, the, of the galaxy in the center, like the sun? And as you go out in the, in the disk of the galaxy, does the, um, uh, does the velocity fall off of stars as they're going around? I showed you how to calculate the, um, the speed of the sun going around the galaxy. So the, the sun, for example, in our galaxy is somewhere here. We can measure its speed. Now, a star that is here, also going in a circular orbit, is it on this plot? And then you can take um, stuff that's out there. I showed you that there are all, there's all this neutral gas, neutral hydrogen that you can detect from, um, uh, from radio telescopes. And they go out to many times the, um, the, the outer parts of the galaxy uh, in stars. So you can have neutral hydrogen here. You can measure their rotational speed from the Doppler shift of the, um, of the 21 centimeter line. So that frequent, that 21 centimeter line will be shifted, redshift or blue shift. And you can measure the velocity. And, and so you can find whether, and, and the, the common expectation was that if you go outside this, the place where most of the mass is, the Newton's theorem tells you that you can take all the mass and put it together in a point in the center and it'll act like a point object. And this is exactly what happens here. The sun acts like it's a point object in the center and it's pulling everything because there's not much mass elsewhere in the solar system. In the, in the galaxy, the mass is distributed, but if most of the mass was in the center, then you would get something like this in the galaxy. And certainly outside the galaxy, it doesn't matter what the distribution of mass is in here. You can put them all together in Newton's first theorem and pretend that all of that is, is uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the center as a point mass and a test particle will go around it as if this was a point mass, right? And so it will give you this, right? So, sorry. so this is where, um, you know, the galaxies are turning. And so you have to measure from inside the galaxy, measure the, the, um, the rotation speeds of the various stars and, uh, and then go out and use the hydrogen gas, the neutral hydrogen gas outside to measure their rotation. And so what you should do is pick a galaxy that's not face on, because if it's a face-on galaxy, then it's rotating like this. You won't be able to measure Doppler shifts because you want to measure the rotational speed of stars. And so a face-on galaxy will not give you radial velocities. So it'll give you transverse velocities and that you can't measure, right? Because you have to wait millions of years. So what people can do is pick up galaxies that are at an angle. And so just from the Doppler shifts of stars from the different ends and then you go out in radius and then you go to the gas that's associated with So this is what Vera Rubin did. And this is what her claim to fame is. In the 1970s, she was a very, very rare woman astronomer who was working for her master's thesis on five of these galaxies. And she did just this. She took um, five galaxies for her master's thesis, measured, the rotation curve, here's V as a function of R, and found that um, in the centers of the galaxies, the, the rotation curve goes up like solid body rotation. I showed you those wheels or that go, which is V proportional to R. And then as you go outside the galaxy, you expect it to come down as one over R to the power half, but it doesn't. It actually keeps on climbing and then becomes flat. Peter Rubin was a woman astronomer in, 19, in the 1960s, um, and um, she was not taken seriously. Her paper was rejected, her master's thesis was rejected. Um, she got her degree, but her paper was not published because nobody believed in this. It was only after um, a senior male astronomer redid her experiment in the 1970s that people realized that that's absolutely right. And then Vera persisted. Towards that, she died uh, a few years ago. I think she would have 
deserved more than a Nobel Prize for making the discovery, this discovery, she didn't, but now a very important telescope has been named after her. But what Rubin did was she, she went on uh, making similar measurements, many, many galaxies, and showed very starkly in the, in the 70s that this is true of all galaxies. And I can tell you, I have done similar experiments in many ways on hundreds of such galaxies. I haven't yet found a galaxy for which the rotation curve actually comes down the way you expect to be outside a galaxy. So what does this mean? So what she did was she took these, I showed you the neutral hydrogen outside the galaxies, but taking um, um, taking uh, adjoined galaxies and, and trying to map the, um, the rotation curve. So what does this mean? This means that this is what you expect from the luminous disk. So you go outside the luminous disk, outside the stars, and then even though inside the things are rotating as a solid body, which means that um, it, um, the distribution of uh, matter is uniform, um, in, the, in the bulge, it should start falling down and outside the galaxy it should go as one over after the bar half. What it means, if it remains flat or even slightly climbing, <coughs> is that, so it's a combination of the solid body rotation and the one over square root of r, and this is what these things look like. The V is constant, means that outside the galaxy, there is more matter that you don't see. This is not the matter that you're seeing in the, um, in the H1 neutral gas because that matter is very small. Those are just test particles. This means that the disk and there's an there's a additional component, which is the halo, which um, is there and that's the dark matter, right? And you can see what that dark matter profile would be like. Uh, if uh, the, that was not there, then the V would go down as one over R to the power half. Instead, it's constant, which means mass in the outer parts is proportional to R. And so the density of this matter is proportional to one over R squared, right? So these come straight out of this equation. So you have the consequence of the first rotation curve, V squared, as I said, R is equal to GM over R squared, M being a function of R. <clears throat> and this tells you M of R, the mass distribution in this. So here is the, a little galaxy in the middle, but it's actually embedded in a big halo of dark matter. You, when you take an optical picture, you only see the little galaxy in the middle, but the halo of dark matter is, is, has a mass profile that is proportional to R. This is constant. That means if rotation curves are flat, then the density of matter, and this is what we call dark matter, density of matter is proportional to one over R squared. So these are what galaxies look like. Um, in, in, they're sitting in large halos of dark matter. Okay, so um, in the remaining few minutes, I'm gonna talk about um, the evidence of this on a much larger scale. So bear with me and I'll take the questions at the end. So, um, um, sorry, I've already done this. What, what are clusters made of? So do clusters have more dark matter than the galaxies themselves? The galaxies we just figured out are sitting in large halos of dark matter, which are much bigger than the galaxies themselves. In fact, as I said, we haven't seen a rotation curve that falls. And so uh, going out to about five times in some cases, the, um, the, uh, the stars in a galaxy. So for example, our galaxy is say 50 kiloparsecs across. Um, we've gone out and from the, the center of the galaxy out to more than 100 kiloparsecs and we haven't found our own rotation curve to fall. Now, 700 kiloparsecs away is the Andromeda galaxy, and its rotation curve has also been traced to about 120 kiloparsecs. We haven't seen it fall yet. So there's more and more dark matter. So we know that in our galaxy, the dark matter goes out to more than 100 kiloparsecs. We know that the dark matter halo of the Andromeda galaxy goes out to more than 100 kiloparsecs, and the centers are 700 kiloparsecs across. So it's quite possible that the dark matter halo of the two galaxies are touching already. 
You don't know. We don't know where the galaxy ends yet. Let that think about it. If you look at a galaxy picture, you don't know how large that galaxy is. We know that at least it's five times larger in radius than the last star you see. But we don't know how big it is. Okay. So that's an important thing. So now the question is, you see a picture of a cluster with hundreds and thousands of galaxies in them. Does the cluster itself have more matter than the galaxies? And the answer is yes. The cluster itself is sitting in a big dark matter halo and the galaxies are moving around in them with their own little dark matter halos. Okay, and this is partially the answer to Junik's question. This was brought by, um, forward by this man called Fritz Wicke, and this is a funny picture of him. He was a very unusual man who worked in Caltech in the 1930s, and he actually suggested this. He suggested this and was not taken seriously. Um, he was not taken seriously at that time. I'm looking at the chat box. My dogs got excited about something. Um, he didn't take it seriously at that time. And, uh, but he wasn't taken seriously at that time. He suggested by looking at the coma cluster, and this is what the coma cluster looks like. It's about 100 megaparsecs away from us. And in the 1930s, just after Hubble started measuring the redshifts of galaxies, he measured many, many redshifts of galaxies in this particular cluster. And he showed from the, um, uh, from the uh, motion of these galaxies that uh, there has to be far more matter than the masses of the galaxies themselves, okay? So since I'm running out of time today, I'm not going to go into that calculation, but I'll start tomorrow with this calculation of how he found the, um, the mass of the cluster itself and found that there is much more uh, um, dark matter in the coma cluster or in, in clusters in general. Um, but let me look at your questions because there looks, seems to be in the chat box quite a lot of questions. And uh, you can raise your hand and see whether we have any questions on what I've covered today. Okay, and leave out um, the measurement of dark matter in clusters from your questions because I'm going to answer that tomorrow. So I'm looking at some of the chat box questions and um, I hope I've answered the question. Somebody asked, how do we know that the edges of the galaxies move faster from the center? I hope I've answered that from the rotation curve. Um, uh, somebody has asked, uh, Adarsh has asked, what experiment proves that most of the mass is at the center of the galaxy? Absolutely not. There is no proof of such that. In fact, the center of the galaxy does not have most of the mass. There's a supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy. It's the mass is 10 to the power 6 times the mass of the sun, the entire galaxy's mass is 10 to the 12 times the mass of the sun. Most of the galaxy is not at the center. Most of the mass is not at the center of the galaxy. That's the whole point. The whole point, if most of the mass was at the center of the galaxy, then the rotation curve would have fallen and it would look like the solar system. It doesn't, that's the whole point. Now, um, is the mass of the dark matter halo proportional to the amount of matter in the galaxy? Uh, I'm not sure what that means because that is the mass of the galaxy. The dark matter, is 80% of the mass of the cluster. So that is the mass of the, the, um, the, uh, the cluster. So if you're looking at the galaxies themselves, the number, if you have a thousand galaxies in a cluster, then of course the mass of the cluster will be proportionally bigger. If there are three galaxies in a cluster or a group, then it will be a smaller um, system. Whether the number of galaxies scales as the mass the, of dark matter in a, in a cluster is an interesting question. And uh, there, there's more to it than that. And I might talk about that later on. So um, there are some hands up. Um, Junik, go ahead again. Uh, so sir, uh, my question was actually, when we're looking at the galaxy cluster, there could be another galaxy which is beyond it and uh, which is lensed by the previous one. So how do we classify between these two that uh, when we look at a cluster, we could see a lot of galaxies. Well, in here, but lensing. Have I talked about lensing yet? No. I'll talk about lensing later on. And then you can ask okay. a question about lensing. But uh, lens, lens doesn't come into this at all. I'm looking at the cluster itself. 
when you're talking of gravitational lensing, which I'll talk about tomorrow, um, lensing, you're looking at lensing um, galaxies that are behind the cluster, very, very far away. They're not part of the cluster. Okay, so I'll talk about it too. Okay, let's go to Shriya's question. Shriya, I have unmuted you. Uh, good afternoon, sir. Sir, uh, you said that uh, uh, we don't know that uh, how far the galaxy is uh, uh, have its boundaries. So, if the uh, how we don't know that how far does it go if by looking at we know that uh, it it would be five times the uh, away from the star we know at the uh, boundary. boundary. So, uh, if we want to know the composition of that cluster or galaxy, so we so when we know we talk about the composition we uh, talk as a whole of something like i am saying that uh, when we take a box so we know that the, these are the composition inside the box so if we don't know the boundaries of that galaxy so how will we approximate about the compositions of that yeah, this is what we have time to find out see i mean at the beginning i told you the role of an astronomer <clears throat> is very different from the role of a physicist to walk in, walks in a lab, has some electronic components on the table, put them together, and does an experiment. If you're an astrophysicist, first of all, you can't go to this galaxy. Yes, sir. Secondly, you cannot repeat the experiment. <clears throat> Thirdly, you have absolutely no handle on setting up the experiment. You can't look up a book and say, oh, this experiment number one, I'm doing this now. The role of an astronomer is that of a detective who has appeared at the scene of murder about six months after the murder. Everything has been cleaned up. There are some clues left over there, right? You see a blood stain there. You might see something lying there, whatever. Very faded clues with lots of errors on them coming from one source, another, etc. And you piece them together and you try to figure out what it is. So this is why astronomy is a hard subject, but it is not impossible. That's what we're trying to show you. So what we're doing is that these clues come from various sources. First of all, you have to figure out where these clues would come from. So you're looking at a galaxy. You're taking a picture of a galaxy. Yeah. And it's an optical galaxy. You know that everything that you see in that picture are a few thousand degrees hot. They're black bodies emitting in optical light. That only tells you a part of the story. Now, then you take a radio telescope. You have to build that radio telescope. You have to be a radio astronomer to build that radio telescope. And you take a picture of the same galaxy. Now you detect the cold gas in that galaxy. You don't see the stars. So you're seeing things that are a few hundred degrees hot. You have to understand the physics. You have to understand the electronics of the radio telescope huge amount of work, and you got a little bit of clue. Then, that's all you get from the Earth. Then you have to go to space to get the other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. You get a little bit of X-ray observations, and that gives you the hot gas, 10 to the power 7 degrees gas. Then you get the gamma rays. Then you get the ultraviolet from an ultraviolet telescope like AstroSat. That gives you things that are 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 degrees hot. Okay, now you're piecing together. You can see the detective working. Now, all these clues have come from very different kinds of telescopes, very different kinds of people. Electronics engineers have built the radio telescope. Optical engineers have built the telescope, uh, the normal telescope. The particle physicists have given you the uh, high energy telescopes. And then you're putting all this together and you're trying to, this is why astronomy is taking such a long time. And this is why, we, it is a subject now, as opposed to many hundreds of years ago, okay? So now you have to take these, that's all you can, that's all you have. You have to take these observations, piece them together and try to find the story. So 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we looked at nice pictures of galaxies and we said, that's the whole story, done. That's your box. Then somebody came and said, no, 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 that's not your box. It's at least 10 times longer, larger or five times larger. Peter Rubin told you. And it's rotating much faster outside. So then you scratch your head. And then you say, okay, then we have something outside. Then somebody comes and says, no, but you know, look at all that X-ray gas in there. Where is that coming from? What is that telling you? 
Is that telling you from that, well, how, how did it get so hot? I'll talk about that tomorrow. So we'll talk about X-ray uh, measurements of masses of clusters and gravitational lensing measures of masses of clusters tomorrow. And see, so this is the, so you understand that your inference has to move with the amount of evidence that's coming in. It's coming in all the time. And this is a very, very young subject. Yeah, imagine what happened to, um, you know, classical physicists a hundred years ago. Suddenly somebody said, oh my God, I just discovered the electron, right, 1903. So then we said, okay, gosh, my goodness, atom, atoms are there, things in the atom, wow. And then somebody discovered the proton, and then somebody discovered the neutron, and the entire story changed, right? And before that, people didn't think that, you know, didn't know what's in the atom. So this is what's happening in astronomy now. And this is why we're giving you these lectures. They're not in textbooks, most of what we're telling you is. And this is a subject in, and so this makes it exciting. What, what makes it exciting is that it is very hard to point to something and say, I have understood this completely because new evidence is coming. I, I, it's a long answer to your short question, but I, I hope this is the approach that is emerging from the lectures we are giving you. Yeah, yeah. So let's go to the next one, Jyoti Thank you so much. Jyoti Moy, I hope I'm uh, trying to unmute you. Yes. Go. Am I yeah. Uh, sir, actually, my question is related to this uh, mid course quiz. Uh, there is one question. There is one question that uh, which of the following statement is false? And um, that is. Most of the Milky Way's mass is concentrated at its core. Uh, to me, it was a right, uh, right statement, but it, the answer it is given that it is a false statement. Uh, so this is exactly what I just told you. No, I answered your question. Most of the mass of the Milky Way is not at its center. It's false. Because if most of the mass of the Milky Way was at its center, then the rotation curve would have been like in the solar system. Right. I, I gave you that question because we talked about this in the when I talked about galaxies, we said that the mass is distributed in the galaxy and most of the mass is not at the center. If you just look at the center, I just told you the supermassive black hole is 10 to the power six times the mass of the sun, whereas the mass of the galaxy is 10 to the power 12 times the mass of the sun. So the mass is distributed. And now I'm telling you most of the mass that you don't even see. And that's that's in the outer parts of the galaxy. In the, in the form of a dark matter halo, okay? So the distribution of dark matter in the galaxy is very different from what you find in the in the solar system. Go ahead, please, yes. Sir, in this question, there is a, was another option uh, that uh, is the sun moves around the center of the Milky Way. So sun is, sun is not in, at the center of the Milky Way. It is left side of the Milky Way. So it is a false statement means yeah, to me, it was a false statement that sun moves around the center of the Milky Way because the sun is not at the center of the Milky Way. It is the left side of the Milky Way. It is not a false statement. It is, it is I told you uh, that the sun is moves in a circular orbit around the center of the Milky Way and it's gone around 20 times. We did that calculation as in one of the lectures that I gave in the first week. The sun moves around the center of the Milky Way Center of the Milky Way means where sun is located. So, and on that circle, uh, um, center is the, or center is on the Milky Way. It's like that. Right. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, Shreya's question in the chat box says that can the black hole within the galaxy be dark matter? And the answer is, see, a black hole is made up of baryonic matter. It's the stars that collapse to become black holes. So black holes, I'm afraid, are stars as well, right? Uh, supermassive black holes must come from some kind of baryonic matter as well. They are not non-baryonic. Non-baryonic matter does not coagulate. They don't interact with each other. And I'm telling you from the evidence that we have from the cosmic microwave background that we know the amount of matter that there is in baryons. And that is why we know that dark matter I'll talk about it tomorrow. Dark matter has to be non-baryonic. And so black holes cannot be dark matter. Right? That's, so there was actually in the 70s, it was quite fashionable 
to wonder whether when dark matter was first discovered, whether that's actually um, showing us black holes. And then the cosmic microwave background showed us that the amount of baryons in the universe is finite, very small, and that can't account for. Okay, Obijit's question. Obijit, I'm trying to unmute you. Sir, I, I have a simple question. I mean, uh, will an isolated galaxy uh, change its shape and structure with time? I mean, I, I, I was just imagining the, a galaxy with a, some kind of a cloud or yeah. maybe so, a cyclone yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, there are very few isolated galaxies, but what you are talking about is technically called passive evolution. There's active evolution, which means that if galaxies evolve by interacting with other galaxies, there's passive evolution, which means that the galaxy left alone like a box. Does it evolve? Yes, it does, because the stars get older and other things. So does its shape change? Its color changes because the stars get older, and um, as the stars get older, they get redder. And so in passively, a galaxy can evolve to become... Um, uh, a bunch of old stars with very little new star formation going on, etc., etc., etc. Now, as um, what holds the galaxy together, the the shape of the galaxy, uh, you must have already done this. You know, it has the, the galaxy has dark matter, the galaxy has stars, the galaxy has gas, etc. So there's some kind of equilibrium that is holding the galaxy together, and it's the dark matter that's holding the galaxy together. Now that itself. Uh, formed from the collapse of a much larger cloud of matter and gas and dust, etc. And so it could be that you're looking at a galaxy now, but it's in, still in the process of uh, collapsing to a much smaller system or much denser system. It is possible. And so if you leave something long enough and observe something and standing in front of it for millions of years, you might see it collapse itself. But if it's not interacting with another nearby system, these dramatic effects that you see of if you're losing in streams and stuff like that, those are tidal effects due to other galaxies. Um, that, that won't happen. Actually, it can stand alone and even then interact gravitationally with another galaxy that's far away due to tidal interaction or direct interaction. Yes. But if you are thinking of a galaxy that's completely on its own, it is hard to do that because gravitation is a very long distance force, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, so, um, so you can imagine this and uh, passive evolution. We, sometimes we think about um, separating out these different in interactions, how much of uh, evolution of a galaxy as a function of time is on its own, the passive part, and how much of it is active, which means it's interacting with other galaxies. These things are done, and people have done this. I mean, if you pick up a standard textbook on galaxies, you will see that there's quite a lot of discussion on how a galaxy left to itself um, you can look at, um, um, uh, you know, there's a famous um, uh, review by Nara and Rana on uh, chemical evolution of galaxies in the annual reviews, which you'll find on the web. Um, it talks about closed box models, which means uh, there are closed box models and open box models. Open box is when you have in exchange of material with other galaxies. And a closed box model is you, leave a, you take a galaxy and leave it how will the inside of that galaxy change? And there are very nice little um, uh, you know, exercises you can do to figure out how it changes. So yes, evolution will happen. With the shape will change is different question from what will the, the properties of the galaxy change, how that will change, because the stars themselves are going to change. Things like that. King could chemical evolution will happen. Okay, so uh, let me see, Mritika is the last one, um, last question, and then I'll look at it. So Mritika, go ahead. Um, Unmuted. Yes. Vitika, are you there? Try to um, unmute you again. I'm not able to unmute you, Vitika. Yes, yeah, go ahead, please. In the interstellar medium, we have neutral gases, molecular gases, and hot intergalactic gases, and there may be something else also, some other gases. From the molecular gas, the stars of uh, they collapse to form the stars, and we also find stars in the spiral arms of galaxies. So, how the galaxies are formed? Two different questions. Now, what you said about stars forming, stars are formed from molecular 
cloud. Right? Because hot gas clouds cannot collapse. Okay. Because their thermal um, uh, random motions are very large and so they cannot collapse. So stars can only form from, so stars form predominantly in these spiral uh, 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 structures because those are lined with molecular uh, gas clouds. Wherever molecular clouds are, there has to be two parts to star formation. And I'll come to your other question in a minute. There has to be two parts to star formation. One is that there has to be old molecular and atomic gas, molecular gas predominantly, because that's at the right um, uh, composition, the right temperature and the right pressure, molecular gas. Um, there are, I mean, we haven't, I don't know whether anybody's done the genes calculation which calculates genes masses. Genes masses are the, the right scale and mass for, for a cloud to collapse. There's a criterion that tells you when you something collapse, right? And the genes mass um, a calculation for stars show that they form from molecular clouds, which have the right pressure, the right uh, temperature and composition, et cetera, for it to collapse to start. So um, wherever molecular clouds are, they can collapse, but they need also something to make it collapse, right? So these are typically tidal attractions or some kind of a force that will allow it to collapse. Otherwise, it will stay in equilibrium. And these can come the disks of spiral galaxies along spiral structure. And, and so this is why that's where it Galaxy formation is a completely different story because galaxies are not... Um, galaxies are much bigger uh, systems, and these are formed. We actually don't know completely yet. The epoch of galaxy formation is something. Different. These have galaxies started forming. I we think that something around red just of five, seven, something like that. At the earliest, and these galaxies were formed at a time when um, the genes essentially would be of that size, and these would not be molecular clouds. These would be essentially big clouds of hydrogen, which uh, um, would uh, be there. You know, the galaxy scales are, um, scales of galaxies are 10 to the power 11, 10 to the power 12 times the mass of the sun, as opposed to uh, individual stars, which are a few times the mass of the sun. And, and so these will, will, will exist in dark matter halos. Stars don't have dark matter halos around them. So there are the dark matter halos which have clouds of hydrogen mostly early on in the universe, much earlier than you're talking about now, the stars forming now, you're talking about redshift of six, seven, eight, ten, 10, and they collapse in, in these dark matter halos to form galaxies, okay? So the, the process is very different. There are very different scales and they are from very different uh, initial compositions. Okay, um, I'll, I'll just quickly um, look to see, I don't see any other important question. Um, uh, Devud Duthi is asking whether non-baryonic matter doesn't interact with each other. What makes them interact with baryonic matter? It does not. It only interacts with gravitational mass. That is why we haven't been able to detect a single dark matter particle yet. Particle physicists have been trying for you know, 40, 50 years now to detect dark matter particles. They have these huge experiments going on and they're not interacting with the baryonic matter. But gravitationally it is, I just showed you, <laughs> just showed you rotation curves. So you can detect their gravitation, their mass, but these uh, dark matter particles don't interact with our experiments. Okay, I'll stop here today and I'll come back tomorrow to talk more about dark matter on the scale of clusters. And, and the evidence for them. And I'll talk a little bit about the larger structures, structures, um, the large scale structure formation in the universe.